Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. So I'm Dave Stegman. Nice to. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm a scientist. I work at uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and uh, I'm also a professor. That's what pays my salary, so that I can do science and <laughs> I get the ever increasing less science time to do science as I advance. But uh, so I run a lab, I train new people to be scientists, I train PhD students, so that's, that's why I decided that's my career to be at a university. And uh, I also mentor people who have gotten their PhDs to be postdoctoral scholars so that they can go on to either industry or um, have a, an academic career themselves. And I also teach um, undergraduates and work with undergraduates. And uh, so I, I've seen the movie. I got, I'm gonna tell you, my favorite part of the movie is when Matt Damon dies. And I thought that was great, great, nice short movie. It's good. <laughs> but then it turns out he didn't die. So, um, so the topic here, so I don't know a lot about potatoes, but I thought, you know, I'll give you food for thought. Okay, food for thought. So I'll leave you with food for thought after this. Uh, okay, so this is one of the movie posters that they had, Bring Him Home. Right, and I thought, yeah, well, this is a sending a huge message out that we got to rescue this guy. So, uh, so we're going to follow me through this that sort of rant uh, narrative that I'll I'll weave for you. Uh, so, next slide. So I thought maybe he can't hear me there. Okay, there, good. Uh, bring him home or not is my is my take on this. So, well, maybe there's a case to leave him there, or maybe there's a case for him to leave himself there and not ask to be rescued. And that's, that's a, a whole different uh, thing to discuss about this movie, because uh, I wanna show you one thing I found. So he told me to give him that. Oh, here is the, so this is a video of a potato growing. It's very high carbon, so not much oxygen in this, and extremely dry soil, some of the driest soil found on the planet that was from the Peruvian desert in the, in the high Andes in the plateau behind there. It's a time-lapse video showing a potato popping up <clears throat> and that adding water and in low pressure and mostly carbon dioxide, the potato is able to grow. So they've tried to replicate the conditions, the surface environmental conditions of on um, Mars, they got, huh? Is that low pressure? Or? It's low pressure, yeah. The Mars, like Mar Mars is a low pressure, and it has uh, mostly carbon dioxide as its atmospheric composition. <clears throat> and what they did is they, they used, uh, you know, this is months, this is a photo taken every day, standard kind of time lapse. Uh, and so you can see the potato is growing. So this is an experiment in cooperation between NASA Ames and this, uh, this place I've never heard of before, the Center for Growing Potatoes, <laughs> which <laughs> is in, uh, and then in this university in Peru as a partnership. <clears throat> now, involving people that are interested in this kind of astrobiology and NASA, uh, it's, it's expensive. It costs, you know, this, this experiment and this, this investigation is gonna cost several hundred thousand dollars. To just to try to test everything, you know, this isn't cheap because you're involving experts that are paid, you know, a modest amount, but it does take time to do the right number of experiments. And it's just one interesting experiment. And it's interesting. Um, and so this was actually the, earlier this year, 2017. They actually just, maybe they're inspired by this movie and they thought, huh, okay, let's try to replicate uh, the conditions. And so I found this just on some news stories, and then there's this YouTube clip that we found. Now, one of the science things that I know on Mars, because I teach a planet about Mars, that the atmospheric pressure is very low compared to Earth, right? And so I thought, there's no way you could have wind speeds 
that strong on Mars if you don't have much pressure. Because if you don't have much pressure, you really don't have much atmosphere to be able to blow stuff around. And so the types of dust storms, they do get large dust storms, but they would never have the capability of, of having that much wind force because you wouldn't be able to generate as that large of a pressure. And so what I learned is that this author actually found this, uh, this an interesting story, backstory to how this movie was made. It was a book, and the book was written, this author was trying out science fiction. He actually published it online kind of for comments and then and got comments back and, and it, it sort of became agreed upon. This was the one scientifically not factual thing, but it was such an important uh, uh, part of the movie. There's, a, there's a, a, a movie term for it that I can't remember. Uh, and so they, you know, he had to allow it to, uh, to, to drive the movie forward. Uh, so. Basically the suggestion that he was gonna starve because of the windstorm. That the, win that the that windstorm could happen. happen. Yeah, he needed a windstorm to happen. He needed that disaster to happen. You know, so to, to make the, the movie, you know, to add the drama and to make, create the situation, though other things maybe could have created the situation. Uh, another thing I liked about the movie is, because I like to talk about myself, <laughs> um, it brought, brought back memories. I worked at JPL for a summer during my, um, during my undergraduate uh, time, and I, I worked with a NASA scientist, and we, we were studying the planet Venus. And uh, yeah, I still have my little JPL badge. It was like one of the cool, cool things. And every summer they have a, an open house at JPL. And so you can go to JPL and they have this open house and they have got the mock, the replicas of the rovers and um, they have stickers. And it's just a cool thing to, to bring kids to. So um, that was fun. It was fun working there for a summer and get, you know, getting going through the, the National Jet Propulsion Lab with the, with the badge. And, I got like a souvenir hat, so. Um, so it was nice to see, you know, JPL featured prominently. Okay, so now we're gonna take a, a left turn. And what I was thinking about, you know, what's the science in this movie? It's that oftentimes uh, people have a, are, it's actually an important distinction to make in the beginning, what's the difference between science and engineering? Because for a lot of people this is blurred, but they're actually very different and, and they're not, and I don't assume that people actually know what the difference is, okay? Because we just hear about science and technology and engineering and how, what, they're very different things. And, and scientists and engineers do very different tasks. And Mark Watney is um, a botanist, so he's a scientist of botany. But many of the things in the movie really are more about engineering and applying science and applying knowledge. And so engineering is really the practice of applying knowledge that has been um, discovered. And science is the systematic study of the world to generate and create new knowledge and to discover how things work and to make, make those scientific discoveries. They're actually quite almost useless and boring until engineering comes along and, and refines it to the point that it's useful, right? So there's a discovery moment and then there's there's, there's sort of this practical aspect to it, and, and they're, they're a great partnership, but they're, they're quite different. And, and so I think that when people um, talk about, this is the science of this, I've got to science the heck out of this, you know, as he said one line in the movie, it's actually he's gonna engineer it, because he's not, what would he, in order to do science, he would have to set up a number of experiments and try different things in each one and make a hypothesis to test that he's gonna change the amount of some variable across all of these, but make a hypothesis beforehand that can predict something and then quantify it, measure it, and see if that um, hypothesis holds. And so there's no actual science in the movie in that sense. But there's a lot of engineering, there's a lot of, you know, let's take what's known, let's try it here, let's do it. If that didn't work, let's try again. Trial and error, an iterative sort of finding your way through it, that's more of an engineering, that's practicing and, and learning by failure. And so the thing science and engineering have in common is, uh, but maybe science is like, you fail forward, you're, you're, you're constantly trying to figure out something, but you, know, you don't just always discover things right away. You, you, you discover how to not, how things don't work 
along the way. And engineering is like that too, but they sort of have a head start because the main, the big discovery has, you know, the, the, the knowledge has been created and they're taking it and, and refining it. So I found that the movie has is, is got a lot of engineering, but these, you know, colloquially, the science and engineering are kind of described as like science, you know, in big, big words. One's science, that's so science and engineering. Um, so with that distinction in mind, uh, the movie, so we, I guess we don't have any real youngsters here uh, that wouldn't have been born in 95, but I remember seeing Apollo 13, and I thought, oh, this movie's kind of like Apollo 13. It's sort of a lot of stuff going wrong. And then we had, remember, Castaway, this is somebody being stranded, so it's, you know, so this was actually, um, pretty obviously, yeah, Apollo 13 plus Fast Away on Mars. And, uh, you know, both, both, uh, both things had good, good elements to them. Uh, this was really a movie about problem solving and using your brain to think your way out and think your way through it. And I think that really drove the movie. And that's what reminded me of Apollo 13, is that let, let's think our way through it. You know, we're, gonna, we're not going to give up. We're going to just keep, keep trying something new. And that kind of real driven by survival, you know, that pressure to figure out stuff, but to remain composed and to keep keep thinking it through and you just keep using that brain don't get hijacked by your your fear and everything to you know just stay cool and, and keep going whereas in castaway it's that psychological thing of aloneness and being stranded and by yourself and your own worst enemy and um, your own you're your own you know you're your you yourself it's just you and your mind is your whole world there for a human starved of human inter interaction so that created an interesting dynamic um, so one experiment we know we won't have to do when we're in space is, or one thing we don't have to problem solve is how to shave, you know, so both the castaway and, uh, and Matt Damon are able to grow beards in different conditions, so. That was truly the starvation experience. If he really had been starving, his body would not be growing hair. I mean, that takes too much protein. His, oh. his hair would be falling out and thinning. Maybe. And that, that distracts him. Hey. Oh, really? That's yeah. an interesting point. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, I, 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 it's just a matter of timing and, and, and like, at what point does the, uh, the body, is it, you know, maybe he wasn't starving enough or something. I, I get to probably so explain it. Six, six months. I, mm. don't, I don't know how long it was reflected. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so we'll go, so, the, so getting back to different experiments. Let's see, who's going to, I don't want him to advance two slides. We have one slide. Here, oh, you can see that. Trying. Oh, did he go away? There we go. Okay, here we are. Great. So, so now here's the the the, the path that my left turn took, and this is where, this is Robert Falcon Scott here and his crew, his expedition team. There's actually more team members, and this is. In 1911, has anyone heard of the Falcon, the Scott expedition to the South Pole? Oh, okay. So, yeah, famous. Uh, it was disastrous, unfortunately. <laughs> um, there's a lot. It's a, it's a rich, inter interesting story. So it's in the South Pole. So their winter, their summer is our winter. So starting off at the beginning of the summer is in November. And that's when you have the daylight, and the goal was to be the first team to the South Pole. So. Um, so this was the British expedition, and it's 800 miles from where they, where they landed to the South Pole. And they have to go there, they have to go back, they have to make the whole plan and the provisions, right? And so the, in 1911, with the technology and the equipment that they have now, this is almost equivalent to going to Mars at this point. You know, it's very, very risky. Uh, it's never been done before. And they were in competition. This is the dro competition drove this. There was a Norwegian team as well, Roald Amundsen, who was a famous Norwegian explorer, had already gotten the prize for the North Pole, gotten the prize for the Venom, and the Norwegians had found the Northwest Passage, so they were sort of the leaders in this. Uh, Roald, they, so this expedition, they brought ponies. <laughs> they brought these mechanical uh, tr sort of tractor things to drag. And they relied a lot on man hauling, which was basically dragging their sleds over terrain, up hills. And this really slows, slows the expedition down and it's sort of accumulate, accumulating. 
So when they finally reach the South Pole, they see the Norwegian flag. Roald Amundsen had got there way ahead of time. He used dog sleds, experienced, stayed light, light and got there fast, got out. And they were just slowed down by this, just so many. There's this expedition, there was just, it's a, not quite a comedy of errors, but a sequence of, of unfortunate, you know, mistakes that, that ended up costing them dearly. Uh, one of the things that they did leave food caches along the way in case they were coming back and they needed to get there. So there was a, they knew there was a food cache stored, but they were really, really in bad shape when they were in their, you know, coming back <clears throat> in March. And uh, some of their team were in worse shape than others. And one other point of this interesting, they had not just made this for a glory of planting that flag in the South Pole, they'd also made it a scientific expedition. They'd come up with ideas of what things to do. They'd sampled rocks along the way that were exposed to get geologic samples. And they had 35 pounds of rocks when, so that all of these team members perished and when they were finally found, you know, they found this sacks and sacks, 35 pounds of rocks, they'd, can't, they'd, they'd not only sampled and took notes of where it was and, and, this, and documented scientifically where these rocks came from. These were valuable and they never gave them up. They, they took them to the pole, they took them back. They never let, they, never, they knew they were in grave danger of, of, of not making it, but they never gave up their, their scientific collections to that point. It's kind of inspiring. So they were camping. They got hit by blizzards. In March, the weather's deteriorating. They're making camps. They didn't have very good shoes. They didn't have very good things. Their, seat, their feet had just been wet for six months, and, and it's just an awful, awful thing. And one of the, uh, the guy, uh, one of the, the, the teammates, he was in pretty rough shape. He's, he said, you know, just, just leave me in my sleeping bag and go. And they wouldn't leave him. They absolutely said no. And so the next day, they're in their, t they're in their tent. They're, they're waiting out a blizzard. and. Uh, and we have the famous last words of this, this uh, Captain Lawrence Oates. He says, I am just going outside and I may be some time. And he walked out of the tent. He told them all. They silently acknowledged that they instantly knew what he meant. And he just walked with his head down, left his shoes in the tent, and, and marched off to... Uh, to try to give, they knew they wouldn't abandon him. So he, he made the decision for them easy. And to try to give those other four people a chance, he sacrificed himself. So it was a heroic, uh, heroic, but it wasn't, an, it wasn't enough. They didn't, they didn't finally, this was a few days before and then a couple of days later, they, they still didn't quite make it. <laughs> Maybe there's, you can look back at every little part where if this thing or that thing at some point could have changed maybe they could have been um, saved. And this is what I was thinking when I watched this movie, is that the science budget, the National Science Foundation, seven and a half billion dollars, which is, which is like almost, uh, which, is, which is a pittance in, in the scale of, of what our, our economy is, and, and it's a trillion, it's our economy's t 10, 20 trillion dollars, and our, and our uh, our science budget is, is, is a tiny fraction, <clears throat> yet uh, in the movie, the, the expense of this rescue would be in, in billions of dollars, essentially, in trying to rescue this person. And the person is asking for that, is asking for billions of dollars. And to me, that means, how many of those potato experiments on Earth is he wiping out? A billion dollars worth of experiments goes a long way. That's, that's a huge amount of science when you spread it over thousands or even millions of different experiments done by thousands of scientists. And so, the, so I start thinking about, you know, what, what, if, uh, what if Matt Damon's character had, had the resilience to survive, but also the, the, a different character to stay there and, and document everything that he could discover and learn about that environment and leave that behind, leave, have that 35 pounds of rocks for the next people, but to not, but to not sort of engage in a, allowing 
<laughs> but it's also the, the failure of NASA, the failure of a giant institution, you know, that, that they, the fear that they're going to look bad, the fear that they're going to get their budget cut because they're already on this, some bare bones budget that, you know, that this, there's, there's a whole psychology involved in, in, uh, the, in the politics of it all. So, um, so that's why I say, you know, bring them home or not. Is, was anybody thinking to leave them there purposefully? <laughs> You know, of course, NASA can't decide that because that would be that would, then the public backlash. They would end, that would end. It would definitely have a negative effect on their agency. But at the same time, um, his allowing him to be rescued. And I think of um, Oates' sacrifice. You know, and not as high as stakes in a way. Uh, because he also was also endangering this other crew to come back and save him. So this seemed to me an incredibly selfish thing, you know, both in terms of endangering his other crew and endangering uh, uh, um, the agency nonetheless if they had failed, and, and endangering, um, and then using the costs to, to recover him. But um, anyway, that's just a, 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 the food for thought for um, the, to satisfy the food part. And so, uh, so I don't have to take any questions that people have. So that's all I had. Yeah, thanks. How did you get your background? Uh, so my background, I did a PhD in geophysics. So I work with in, um, at the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics and people who study earthquakes and volcanoes and seismologists and you know, that study earthquakes and um, people who study the magnetic field you know, things like that. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. what, what would have been the likelihood of him being able to contact the ship that left? And, you know, it, it, as early as he could make contact, and wouldn't there be a, a way to reverse course that they could have figured out? <laughs> yeah, these things are just come down to, you know, t t technical, um, ability of, a, of one person in one, in one thing of like communications and, and the way these systems are built, it's, uh, yeah, if he's, if he's got some training, but if, if it involves sort of reconfiguring something, you know, the, the amount of specialization and expertise to be good at and employed at the thing that you're doing may not be it, you know, you don't have the breadth of. Uh, he figured out, uh, they figured out basically how to hijack the mission, mm -hmm. but it just seems to me like he could have made contact with the ship that he had just come from easier than the command center. Um, he would have to find the right frequency and, you know, he may, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. He, it's, yeah. The, yeah. Um, yeah, you probably wouldn't have the antennas to receive any signals, but on Earth they could have used like a uh, really large uh, radio telescopes to probably to pick up the signal from the uh, rover or, or, any, or even the suit for that matter. Uh -huh. So I think you could uh, probably be able to trans might be able to transmit back to it. Yeah, all the satellite, like all the, all the spacecraft that NASA send out basically communicate to a deep space network. Yeah. And that deep space network is basically how a central um, communications hub, you know, at, at JPL and, and at Houston. And so that it's sort of whatever frequencies are being used, the spacecraft to connect back to, to home at these, um, at the deep space network. You know, I, I think that you kind of have to route through there or something. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the other thing. Yeah. Rover probably would be tied into the satellite, so you'd have to. Uh, yeah, they relay through satellites that are out there. I mean, if you go behind the, uh, uh, go to the ravine or something like that. Okay, well, I don't want to, okay, yeah, yeah, another so, question. Uh, growing potatoes, um, I mean, yeah. you had that thing in the, in the soil, so would, if you take the soil and you add water to it, is it going to like react because you're going to have like some weird radical in the uh, soil? Oh, yeah, that does one, there's one point that I did, did leave out. Um, so they got this soil from the high desert, the, An the Andean desert there in the Atacama and the Peru, 
And so it's one of the driest places on the planet. Um, and the soil composition isn't exactly what the, we would think the soil composition on Mars is, but it's, it's dirt, you know. <laughs> so, and then the, and the atmospheric conditions were similar to what, those, those are, you can replicate yeah, to Mars. Dry, <laughs> so super dry, but the main difference between the Earth, Earth, Martian soil and the Earth soil is microbes. Because there's, there's always microscopic microbes, no matter where you are. If you're deep, deep in the Earth's crust, or in the driest desert, anywhere, under, in a glacier, under thick miles, like everywhere they've ever looked, they found little microbes. And you know, those microbes may or may not be necessary to help um, organisms flourish or grow or something like that. So I guess they can also you know, introduce microbes in, but um, we don't know what you know, the native microbe, microbial, whatever, uh, that would be in the Martian soil. Uh, yeah, but in, in the end, yeah, wa it's just it's dirt and yeah, adding water just make mud. So we see a lot of these, these uh, we see that rovers have found evidence of pretty common processes that we see, that we, we know from Earth, you know, we add the water to, to um, areas where there's fine grain sand or dust and it just makes mud and dirt. So we Okay, yeah, so this is exactly the type of scientific experimentation that you would have to do, right? It's systematically like, well, now I'm making, I'm interested in what the microbial effect is, right? So now you want to design a set of experiments and, and, and try all sorts of different microbial communities and, and sterile control and, and make a hypothesis of whether or not you think it's going to work or not and then make the experiments to try to test that hypothesis and then examine your results, you know? Well, this, this one experiment that they're showing in that clip, they successfully grew that potato. But um, another thing is they used potato clipping. So then there's some question about how to get the, a potato clipping you know, on, through surviving a long journey to Mars. Because it gives the potato a head start. So. Yep, so there'd be another thing to control if you, so if these are proper experiments, they're thinking about these types of things. You know, the types of light, the exact type of radiation that's getting um, to the, to the to, you know, on the surface, the, both the amount and the, and the wavelengths that are represented, the intensity, the so amount, the cyclic. So I guess that would have been a, a form of dry ice that would have con condensated because carbon dioxide does not have a liquid phase. It goes directly from a gas to a solid to an ice. So it's like dry ice. Dry ice, when you, it sublimates, it goes directly from a solid you know, to a, 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 a fog, right? And so the reverse would happen. It doesn't go through a liquid phase. And so that would just, that ice was essentially dry ice. Well, yeah, it would be, yeah, there would be water ice because the whole thing was enclosed in water. So, yeah, that it had exploded. Yeah, so if you break the pressure inside that greenhouse, then the pressure goes to zero. All that water is now at a much colder, lower pressure, so it, yeah, it would instantly freeze. Well, part of it boils off, which evaporates and cools off, the rest of the water just freezes. Mm-hmm, exactly. Cool. Which is all right. Time we have for today, but big round of applause. Thank you. Okay, yeah, you're welcome.